Perfect. So our uh, next uh, speaker is uh, uh, Patrick McCory. He's actually a, a member of the uh, technical program committee for uh, this conference. Uh, he is uh, co-founded PISA Research and a senior system engineer at uh, Intura. And um, uh, Patrick will talk a bit about the challenges uh, for layer two protocols. Please, Patty. Thank you. Well, thank you, Atai. So I sort of designed this talk because after this session, there's going to be a, a panel about layer two protocols. And I sort of want to set the scene for the panel so everyone here understands what we're talking about during the panel. And so really what I'm going to talk about is, you know, what even is a roll-up and what does it mean to be secure for a roll-up? So the first question is, why do we care about roll-ups for? And if anyone's used Ethereum over the past uh, year, you'll notice that the fees have been slowly going up and then they became exponentially going up. So in 2019, you know, the daily fees were $100,000 a day. We have Bitcoin maxis complaining about the Bitcoin, you know, the Ethereum fee. And then uh, in 2020, July, Ethereum fees hit about $1.2 million a day. And then recently they hit $60 million a day and $100 million a day. So clearly the fees on Ethereum are becoming outrageous and it's becoming very expensive to send transactions. I think today, because it was an NFT drop last night, the fees were about $10 million on Ethereum. And clearly that's too, you know, the average transaction fee becomes $10, $20 just to do a transfer. And that's too expensive for most users. But also over the past two to three years, we've had new layer two protocols spawn and emerge from the, from the ashes to solve this problem. You know, we have Arbitrum, ZK Sync, Sailor, Aztec, Optimism, Starkware, ZK Spot, Polygon, Loopring, and all these protocols want to solve blockchain scalability for Ethereum predominantly. Why does that even matter? You know, why do we even care about these protocols? Surely we can scale, you know, in a more naive way. And so what I do want to ask people here is, you know, who's ever deposited coins into an exchange or an online service like Binance, Coinbase, Bitstamp? Um, I mean, this is a, a call, so it's hard, hard to raise your hand. Maybe you can make jokes in the chat and then I'll see your notification and I'll just take that as a yes, you've deposited coins there before. But why is this important? Well, because these services are technically you know, layer two protocols in the sense that they take transactions from Ethereum and they take them off Ethereum and they happen on their central service. So, you know, the transactions are off chain on this centralized service. But this isn't a great way to scale the network because it's basically a fully custodial service. If you go on Coinbase or Bitstamp, you know, they can freeze, confiscate, they can lose our funds. Their layer two database is so peak, it's not publicly auditable. They could be running a fraction of reserve and we have no idea. And of course, they have full power over ordering our transactions. And um, we've heard enough about MEV this week to know that ordering transactions is a superpower for sequencers to have. Uh, another issue is that if you use these services, you know, they're custodial and they're high risk. They're just difficult to keep secure. So there's this nice tweet from Gunan 2016, you know, 33% of Bitcoin exchanges have been hacked. And then when they get hacked, it tends to be large scale. We know Meg Gox lost 850,000 Bitcoin and Bitfinex lost 120,000 Bitcoin. That is about five years ago, but you know, these central services still do get hacked, although not as much as they, as they used to. So the real question for these layer two systems are, you know, can we build a Coinbase-like experience while still allowing users to maintain self-custody of their funds? And so that's what we're going to find out in this talk. And what I want to do is I want to explore roll-ups or more generically commit chains, basically from first principles and give everyone an idea of the environment that they live in. You know, so what is a commit chain? How does it work? What is the wider environment and the assumptions? Who is the adversary and what is their power? And what are the security goals that need to be satisfied before we consider a roll-up secure such that we still have custody of our funds? Uh, and yeah, this will set you up for the rest of the hackathon and it'll set up the rest of my team because we're all working on rollups right now. So a commit chain is fairly straightforward. We still have a sequencer and the sequencer is posting little checkpoints periodically to Ethereum. A checkpoint will contain a list of transactions and the latest state of the layer two database. 
So then when others come on, the idea is that this layer two database would be publicly available and anyone can compute it and they can verify it against this checkpoint. So then Alice comes along and Alice will deposit one coin into the system. Now, the big important difference here is that when I deposit one coin in the Coinbase, I am giving over custody the Coinbase and Coinbase is going to have full custody of my funds. In a commit chain, I lock my funds into a special contract that we can call the bridge contract. The bridge contract essentially has custody of the funds and not the sequencer. And the bridge contract has to be convinced that all is well on the layer two system before those funds can be withdrawn. So really Alice has given custody over to a smart contract and not to the layer two sequencer or to the network itself. And that's like the big crucial difference with these layer two protocols. We're building bridges, we're all bridge engineers. But then Bob comes along. Hi, Bob. And Alice wants to send one coin to Bob. So he'll send a message. So give it to the sequencer. Then the sequencer can notify Bob to say, Bob, you have received this coin. You've received this transaction. It's not finalized yet. And later on, we're going to discuss what it means to be finalized. But this transaction is currently pending. So Bob is aware that he's received a coin, but it's currently pending. And the you know, Ethereum and the layer one and everything else is not aware that transaction has happened yet. And then we wait around for more off-chain transfers. And then eventually, the sequencer will create a checkpoint, post it to Ethereum, and that should confirm Alice's transfer to Bob. And so the bridge contract is then aware that this transfer has occurred, and Bob is entitled to withdraw those funds if he wishes. And then periodically over time, these checkpoints just keep getting posted. And ideally, a user or an external observer, they should be able to fetch the full transaction history, although we'll discuss what a transaction means here, but they should be able to fetch the entire history of the network. And then given these checkpoints, they can you know, recompute the layer two database themselves, and they can verify that the layer two database is correct. There's no invalidity in transitions. All transactions are valid and indeed that they have you know, one coin on the system. Then they can use that data to convince the bridge contract that they can withdraw their funds from the system and back onto Ethereum. But what does it mean to be secure for a commit chain? Well, there's this really nice tweet by Georgios where he typically says, you know, layer two security has to equal, equal layer one security. You know, that's basically what layer two should mean. What I would typically argue is that layer two protocols cannot have the exact same security as layer one, but they can get pretty damn close. And it's really this closeness that will distinguish a lot of the protocols that we'll see during the panel. And yeah, we'll get to what it means to be close. I'm sure that's gonna be a discussion point right there. Um, so what does it mean to be secure? So in order for us to have an idea what it means to be secure, we have to define some protocol assumptions. We have to have some type of a threat model and finally, some security properties. You know, what are the security goals of this system? So what's our adversarial model? And I've kept this very simple to keep the, you know, as an introduction to the topic. Typically, we have the adversary, and they can control the entire message flow on the layer two system. They can, you know, view, reorder, and drop all messages on the layer two system. The only thing they can't do is prevent Alice interacting with the layer one blockchain itself. So everything on the layer two is effectively not trusted. And only the layer one and the message delivery to the layer one can be trusted. What we also assume is that the adversary can basically corrupt all parties, except one honest user who is the user themselves and the layer one blockchain in the smart contract. Basically all the sequencers can be corrupted and all other users can be corrupted and all is just funds to still be safe. You know, that's like the ultimate adversary there. And so, and of course, we have to assume they can't break cryptography because then that would be really, really boring. You know, they're weak against signatures, hashes, snarks. And this is really the most powerful adversary you could think of when you consider rule ops. And I, you know, not all rule ops are going to fully constrain or out, outright defeat this adversary. And sometimes you don't always want to, you know, you want to add some trust because that makes the system a little nicer to use. But another way to look at it and I have this really funny picture, you know, there's a sequencer who's the adversary. We have an honest user, this layer one smart contract. They're working together and they're sort of fighting this dragon to make sure that you know, all the funds are safe. 
And even then for the ZK variants, we'll see this honest user becomes a proving system. So you don't even need an honest user anymore. But if you don't have this epic bottle on your hands, then you're really not developing a layer two system. And maybe it's a fun system, but it's not layer two. So it doesn't you know, get involved in my talk. So security properties, you know, what does it mean then to be secure for a rollup? What are the problems that we need to solve to you know, fight this adversary? The first problem is called the data availability problem. What does this mean? So the question is, how do we guarantee the transaction history for the layer two ledger is publicly available? So what we post on Ethereum typically is the checkpoint, which is the hash of the layer two state and a hash of the transactions that are being executed. Now there's several reasons why we want to have this data publicly available. One is audibility. For some of these systems, we have to re-execute every single transaction to verify that the layer two ledger is correct. The second is interaction. You know, Alice may be performing a swap on Uniswap on a layer two system, and she wants to verify what the current exchange rate is. If she can have a copy of the database, she can verify what the exchange rate is before she performs her swap. And finally, withdrawal. She needs to have the data to convince the layer one bridge contract that she can indeed withdraw her funds from the system or that she's entitled to withdraw her funds from the system. Um, bingo, this is where we get rule ops. Roll ups are one way to solve the data availability problem. And basically you just take all the data that's relevant for recreating the layer two database and you just post that to Ethereum or the layer one blockchain. Now this changes the assumption a little bit. You know, we would assume that the layer one blockchain is computationally constrained and you know, data you know, bandwidth constrained. Here we're assuming Ethereum and the layer one blockchain can process you know, the, the bottleneck is, you know, bandwidth and not computation. So the computation is taken off chain, but all of the layer two, you know, data is then posted and published on Ethereum. So basically bandwidth storage is now the bottleneck for these layer one blockchains. And it's one of four ways to solve the problem. And I'll not explain the other three ways because it's not relevant for this talk because everyone's building effectively rule ops. The next problem that needs to be tackled is the state transition integrity problem. So again, the operator, the sequencer is going to post a checkpoint to Ethereum or the layer one blockchain. What if they include an invalid transaction in the list of transactions? And of course, there's a reason why they'd want to do that. If they can include an invalid transaction, they can steal all coins on the system. So this is where we end up with, we get these optimistic rule ops, the ZK rule ops, more generically, you know, a fraud proof system. So you post a checkpoint, there's like a two week period, a challenge period, and anyone can provide evidence that indeed the checkpoint is invalid, you know, proof of fraud. Very, like very simple idea. The other approach is a validity proof where every time the sequencer posts a checkpoint, they'll provide a ZK proof that this checkpoint is well formed, all state transitions are valid, and you know, everything's valid with this checkpoint. And we're gonna hear much more about fraud proofs and validity proofs during the panel, but just to be aware, they're only solving this one problem with the state transition integrity. You know, how do we convince Ethereum? How do we convince the bridge contract that this uh, checkpoint is indeed valid and it contains no invalid transactions? And finally, what I'm currently calling the withdrawal integrity problem, although I've now got a better name for it and I haven't updated my slide. The real question is, you know, how does the user withdraw their funds if the sequencer no longer cooperates and the, you know, the sequencer's offline and the user needs to get their funds out? So you know, the user could send them a withdrawal transaction and the diverter is like, nope, never, stuck forever. <laughs> um, and there's generally you know, two ways to solve that. You know, one is that um, on the layer one blockchain, that's responsible for ordering transactions. And I can just take my layer two transaction and post it directly to Ethereum and just bypass the sequencer altogether. Now, this problem gets a bit more complicated when you consider smart contracts. Because I'm no longer, so if we consider a smart contract rule up, my funds could be locked into a smart contract. You know, it could be on an LP pool on Uniswap. So it's not just about it, you know, ensuring that withdrawal transactions can be processed, but the user has to have the ability to enforce state transitions without the cooperation of the sequencer. They need to you know, 
push layer two transactions for state transitions, they can unwind their position and then withdraw their funds. So, you know, they may have to send several transactions in a row before they can get their coins out. And all of those transactions have to be executed if the sequencer is not cooperating. And so, you know, there's a whole bag of, bag of ways to solve that problem. And we're going to talk about that during the panel. Uh, so I've just summarized these three core security properties, data availability, state transition integrity, and withdrawal integrity. So we would like to think if we can solve all these problems, then hopefully we can slay, you know, slay the beast, you know, with a little Ethereum uh, shield there and deploy a secure layer two system and everything's good about the world. But, you know, even if we could solve all these problems perfectly, is it still a secure system? And the answer is sort of like, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, because there's other problems that we need to consider. The first is order fairness and extractable value. Uh, we've heard a lot about this during the week. And the idea is that the sequencer still has the power to order transactions in the blocks or you know, order transactions that are executed on the rollup. So they could take a victim's transaction, sandwich it, and extract value from that transaction. Now, the question is, is this a business model or is it an outright attack on the system? I don't think there's any consensus on this. I think everyone disagrees. Um, but there's a bit like Robinhood. Robinhood's basically a sequencer that's uh, you know, extracting value from all your trades. So it could be a business model, but we'll see. We'll talk about that during the panel. And of course, MEV, when I took this screenshot, they were making a lot of money for the miners and it keeps going up. This is back in April. And it's, I think it's double or triple that now, the last, the last I checked. The next question is, is uh, the fast path and the slow path. You know, what does the sequencer really offer us in this system? Why do we need a sequencer in order to you know, take the transaction data and post that to Ethereum? You know, why is that useful? Why don't I just post a layer two transaction myself? Well, sequencers offer the fast path. And if you just push directly to Ethereum, then and that is effectively the very slow path. Okay, so the reason there is, is that when I visit a rollup website, let's just say Uniswap on uh, a rollup provider, uh, when I send a transaction, I'm gonna send it to the sequencer, the sequencer should acknowledge it, and then I should have some confidence that my transaction was accepted and it will eventually be executed the way I expect. And that sort of promise is what we're going to discuss during the panel as well. You know, what does it mean to get a promise from the sequencer? But that would be the fast path experience that would give us a Coinbase-like experience as well. And of course, a very slow path is you post it to the layer one blockchain, then you wait until it's eventually ordered and it's eventually executed by the, by the layer one. And that could be very slow. Uh, so we still need to consider, so basically the whole point there is that if the sequencer offers the fast path, we still need to consider who can be a sequencer on how decisions are reached. So we really need to consider, you know, how do sequencers get selected? Or is it centralized? Are they appointed? Is it proof of stake? God, is it even proof of work? You know, we got a proof of work chain here. That's not, um, you know, and they're really, that's all about rate limiting, you know, rate limiting and trying to align incentives on what it means to be a good sequencer. And then also the consensus protocol. How does everyone reach agreement on the next set of transactions to be executed? Um, you know, is that a lottery? Is it BPFT? You know, is it like majority vote system? Is it round robin? And how does this get checked by the on-chain smart contract as well? You know, how does the bridge contract be convinced that you are indeed a sequencer and you're entitled to, you know, send a boss of transactions to finalize them, et cetera, et cetera. And these also open up different attacks, like you know, denial of service, slowing down the protocol, uh, just trolling. You know, people on the internet like to troll. It is free. Um, so basically, all I've really highlighted during this talk is a bunch of problems around rule ups, and I'm not really given any solutions for them. And that's because we have this panel, and it's going to be much more fun. The ox that you know, the protocols that are developing this, how have they solve these problems in their protocols. So I have about 10 minutes until the panel. So is there any questions about the problems that I've highlighted before we move on to the panel? So, so everyone's on the, the same page about what we're talking about. So I think I've seen some things pop up in the chat. So let me just move my screen over. Ah. Um, okay, I don't think that was relevant to me. That's good. 
So does anyone else have any questions about rollups and about the problems that I highlighted? Well, I need to ask something. Uh, yeah. uh, in slide, you mentioned fast and slow path. In the slow path, you mean uh, still interacting with the layer one bridge contract, but without sequencer, right? Yes. Exactly. So what you can imagine okay. is that the fast path is when I, uh, you know, I can connect to the sequencer, I send them my transaction, they acknowledge it, they could tell me how my transaction is executed, then I'm convinced that my transaction will be executed faithfully. You know, I'm somewhat trusting them with that, and that trust is something we can have to talk about. But if I do the slow path, then in some systems, I have to send the transaction directly to layer one. I have to wait until layer one orders the transactions, and then eventually I can verify how that's going to be executed, and that could take, you know, anything from a few minutes to a few hours. So it's much slower than getting a nice promise from a sequencer. Um, any other questions, by the way, you can just drop them in the chat if you don't want to use a mic. Regarding posting all layer one data. Uh, won't it lead to blockchain bloat? Yeah, so sorry, just for that question. So um, I think this is one of the things we've learned since the 2017 block size wars. You know, one of the reasons why we didn't want to increase the block size is because it would place a larger load on light clients to verify the, the blockchain itself. But now over the past few years, we've realized, you know, there's like three resources that we need to consider. One is storage, like state bloat. The other is computation and then bandwidth, you know, just pushing blocks and then pruning blocks. So here the idea is that, you know, computation and state bloat are like the two biggest resources that constrain the, you know, Ethereum today. And now what we're really doing is taking those two resources and moving it to the rollup. And that becomes the rollup problem. You know, you could argue that's kicking it down, a can down the road, but you know, there's, as we'll see, there's nice ways to compress data. So then on Ethereum itself, the bottleneck just becomes bandwidth. You know, how much data can I push through this system? Uh, and that doesn't bloat the blockchain because it's data, you know, it gets read and it gets discarded. So the state doesn't actually grow that much. It's just, uh, you know, literally how fast can blocks properly get across a network and that becomes your bottleneck for scalability. So now you could do, you know, more transactions given the same resources you would have had because you don't have to worry about computation. So that's sort of the logic behind why rollups are a good scalability solution. So I think that's a really good question. Um, so basically he's saying rollups do in these skill throughput, but isn't the latency for the fast path also on the same order as the consensus latency since rollup state rules have to be posted on the main chain? So I think ultimately, yes, your latency in terms of ultimate finality is one when it gets posted to the main chain, but actually it's, it's argue, depending on the scheme, it's arguably longer. Uh, so if you're a ZK rule up, as we'll see, you know, we'll discuss this. They may want to collect a bunch of transactions before they post them. So you could be waiting like a few minutes or a few hours before your transaction gets posted to Ethereum. If it's like an optimistic rule up, you could post your transaction, but then it takes some time until your transaction, the transaction order is finalized. And then eventually it gets executed. Then you have to wait until that gets executed. So, um, if you don't trust the sequencer, then it's very, very slow. If you trust the sequencer and you just take them faithfully to say, oh yeah, uh, your transactions mind the way it is, or it's going to be confirmed, then it's, it's faster. But you, are, you have to wait ultimately until the layer one's convinced. And that's like the ultimate latency for ultimate you know, guarantees. Well, of course, I'm going to ask that question. So maybe even the panelists would disagree with me, but we'll see. That's my current impression of how these rollups work. Cool. Um, I mean, if there's no more questions, we could take like a two minute break until the panel starts. Um, and what do you, oh, what do you think, Ty? Yeah, the ball is yours. It's your call. Okay, I'm just going to see if everyone's here. Um, I have a question, Patrick. Yeah, go for it. Yeah. So uh, when you say sequencer in rollups, so do you think in uh, optimistic and ZK is going to be, let's say, more work in ZK 
So, I mean, because of obvious reasons, ZK is more computationally intensive. So there is going to be more, let's say, fee in case of ZK that will be given to sequencers. So this is where a lot of the, the nice panel discussions are going to come. So the question is, do you think ZK transactions will be more expensive because you have to verify a proof? So what we're going to see is that, you know, when we, when you, uh, when a sequencer posts data to Ethereum, one, they have to post data about the transaction and two, they have to post a proof. Now, what's nice about ZK is that you don't have to post the actual transaction itself. You don't have to say why. So in ZK, what you can do is you can post a database update. You can say, here's a key value pair. Here's a state diff updated to the new value. You don't actually have to post the entire transaction to Ethereum. You don't have to post a signature, the function call. Uh, you only have to post how to update the database and not why that update is valid because that why is covered by the ZK proof. And that's really cool. And that's what we're going to see. You know, if you perform like 1,000 Unisofts back and forth or 1,000 Oracle updates, there's only one update to the database. And so they can, you know, amortize that or aggregate it and really reduce the gas costs for, you know, very frequent transactions that occur. And obviously what I'm going to ask is, you know, what are the trust assumptions around that? You know, if I have to collect 1,000 updates off chain, what, how, how are we trusting the sequencer there? Uh, did that answer the question, Avi? I think so. Um, um, yeah, yeah. Cool, okay.